Hello and welcome to another episode of the Small Gold Subscribers Sound Off series. And today I have with me a first time guest, but someone that you're probably all familiar with and I've had much interaction with him. His name is James Henry Anderson. How are you doing today, James? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Louis? Oh, great. And thank you. And welcome to the show. And thanks for joining me today. James, the reason I wanted to have you on was not just to share your insights about the gold and silver market, but also I think a lot of our subscribers would be interested in learning how you got interested in the precious metal space and then how you managed to make a career out of it. So I'll take it away, James. Well, great. Um, if we, let's see, if we go all the way back to my childhood, I'm probably like a lot of you, you know, I had grandparents who hoarded some pre-64 silver in their closets and when i was a little child i found them and broke them out and you know kind of was intrigued by the whole concept of well there was silver in our coins and now there's not etc uh and then i went off to school you know college and university of uh, loyola university new orleans and was lucky enough to have a couple professors who had a little bit of an austrian bend in their teaching and so you know, they would give you the Kinsey and Dribble, but they'd also give you a little bit of uh, insight as to why perhaps the Kinsey and uh, monetary system isn't uh, the most efficient model. And uh, so I, I was exposed a little bit uh, to, the, uh, to that in university. And then after graduating, I got my degree in finance and I lived a couple of years in Central America and <clears throat> I, not just Central America, but I also lived in South America. I lived in Argentina in 2003 and 2004 and that was for anyone that knows the history of Argentina was just after they had a peso devaluation um, where the peso was pegged one to one in the 1990s uh, and that wasn't going to work out because their capital account was going negative and so I think 2001 into 2002 they devalued the peso versus the US dollar from one to one down to one to three and by the time I was there it was getting toward one to four so I saw the um, ramifications uh, on a culture, what that does to people, what that does to the, the corrosion of belief in institutions, the corrosion of belief in government, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it was good in the sense that I was able to bring U.S. dollars down there because I would just save in the summers when I was caddying at golf courses. And I, would, I went down there and did an internship. I had dollars saved. So it went a long way for me, uh, but seeing it, you know, in, in real time, firsthand really gave me a broader picture of, wow, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy when you travel, you start to understand the concept of, you know, currency valuations and what you can purchase in certain places versus others and how far sometimes your U.S. dollar will go in terms of goods and services versus, you know, in the United States. And so it starts to broaden your horizon or your your ideas to well this doesn't make all that much sense uh it really doesn't in the sense that i can buy a filet mignon the size of my fist in argentina for two bucks and then in the united states that thing's at least 15 <laughs> so it just didn't it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and when kinsians try to explain it it, it really doesn't either so uh, that kind of started a little bit of i suppose intrigue in the in the subject and living in la uh in 2006 7 i started to get involved with the ron paul campaign the 2008 presidency and that really took me down the rabbit hole and i was at the time was starting to invest in gold and silver and i made all the the standard mistakes that people do you know i bought i think gld for a, t a short time period uh, maybe even slv and um and then i started buying bullion and you know i was spending so much time you know researching and and and, and being intrigued in the subject that I, I realized, you know, I should just go ahead and start looking for work in this industry because I really do enjoy it. And I, I think it's the right place to be at this time. And so kind of got me down the rabbit hole and, and I, I went out for an interview, didn't get the job. And a couple of months later, I didn't like that answer. So I called them back and the guy they hired didn't work out and I got the job. So I started working in the industry in uh, perfect timing. It was in like August of 2008. And, uh, you know, I could tell right then and there uh, the situation we were in, it was going to be a good business. And I, we were working in a small house at the time. It was just this upstart right next to Loyola Marymount College in L.A. And uh, one thing led to another and the business really, really did well and worked with that outfit for about six years and then uh, have been working in this industry pretty much ever since uh, for various outfits. But I started working with SD Bullion in the last year or so, helping when, helping them with their content marketing and their their podcasts, et cetera. So 
Uh, it's been a, you know over 10 years I've been in the industry, and I still believe this industry has further to go. I still believe that this bull market that started really in 2000, you know, obviously it's been delayed a lot with all the um, central bank interventions, but my hunch is that the 2020s will be even better for gold and silver than it was in early 2010s. Hmm. Well, very interesting because for most people, their first introduction – to economics impacting themselves happened in 2008, 2009 during the financial crisis. And that's when you actually hit, you were already in the industry when that hit. And that actually gave it a good impetus for people to come and check out what you guys were doing, selling gold and silver. But you picked it up back in 2003, 2004 by actually seeing what happened in Argentina. So, but then you mentioned you started to get into uh, the gold and silver space and you said you made some mistakes like purchasing gld and perhaps even slv those are for our listeners etfs that are exchange traded funds that track the price of gold and silver and why do you say those were a mistake yeah those are a mistake in the sense that i wanted it for all the reasons that are outside the financial system something that i had that was in my hand that was no middleman in between it whereas gld and slv are, are really more for trading it's a vehicle for a short-term trade perhaps a medium-term trade you might hold it for a month you know or a, a year or two here or there based on you know your 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 perspective that maybe gold or silver is going to go up or down, you may short it, etc. But it's merely a derivative. I mean, when you go down the the the, the perspective of the prospectus of these uh, uh, these two ETFs, you start to read into it, and it just basically says anything can happen here, and we're not liable. So right. I I personally um, I don't think that either of them are a safe haven. And you know, if you look at the price action in 2008, how they performed versus say uh, bullion. Uh, bullion outperformed GLD and SLV hands down. I mean, is certain products like uh, the Silver Eagle went into hyper. Uh, they they just all of a sudden the premiums on those things exploded because there weren't that many available, and you could sell them for 16, 17 bucks an ounce when spot price was at nine dollars. With SLV, you were sitting there just below nine bucks basically. So you, your uh, derivative didn't perform as well as bullion. And my expectation is in the future that will be the same case. Well, also the case is if the stock market is closed, then GLD is not tradable. And when the stock market is closed just during the weekends and after hours, there's there's no trading as well. Okay, so now that you are at SD Bullion, and I wanted to ask, a lot of people are, are looking at the inventory that you have, and some people are just strictly, I want my Silver Eagles, I go to SD Bullion, you get a good price, and I'm done. But what about the other silver products? How does SD Bullion decide which other silver products to carry and how well do they sell compared to the American Silver Eagles or the other standard bullion product, the Canadian Silver Maple Leaf? So when it comes to deciding what inventory to hold, bullion dealers got to kind of weigh a few things. I mean, first and foremost, we have to kind of analyze, well, what are the products our customers know and trust and love and they want, you know, typically. Uh, so like right now I'm working on a, a top 10 gold and silver bullion product video for SD bullion. And so that, that took me in, in, you know, looking at the data of last year and the years prior and trying to analyze, well, what are the top 10 products? Uh, so it's your typical ones like the silver Eagle, your one ounce silver rounds, your gold eagles, your gold maples, Canadian silver maples, your one ounce gold bar, 10 ounce silver bar, 90% silver. These are like the staples, right? And so having those staples is key. You got to have those in your inventory and you have to have speed of delivery. It has to get to the customer quick. And so those are the mainstays. But there are also other products that we'll carry depending uh, on the situation, if it makes sense, where we can produce a win for everyone, not just ourselves, but our customers too. So for instance, like last year, uh, Tyler, the uh, proprietor here, he uh, went out and had it, struck a deal with uh, the New Zealand Mints and created two silver coins that were New Zealand official coins, um, the Roaring Lion and the Tree of Liberty. And he got them priced at 99 cents an ounce over spot for a silver coin, which is unheard of. There's never been a silver coin. I don't, in my, in my 10 years or more of experience in this industry, of seeing a, a sovereign silver coin uh, with the legal tender face value of that price. So the, the closest would be probably the Australian kangaroo, correct? Yeah, maybe 129 that got down to yeah. at one point. And, uh, you know, they, they had a hit because when they 
when they launched that, there was a problem with the U.S. Mint, and mm -hmm. so they were able to capitalize on that, and they had huge sales when they launched that uh, Australian kangaroo the first time. But this uh, this allotment last year was a win-win for everyone because you know we locked in a decent premium uh, on that 99 cent sale, uh, and we limited the minage to 50,000 units. So each each of the two respective uh, designs only had 50,000 units, and so they sold out rather quickly. And now on the secondary market, it seems like they're trading pretty well between collectors. So, and I I have both of them. They were, they were really well done. They were high high quality, well done. Republic Metals did a good job on those those two coins. Okay, let's say now a bullion dealer like SD Bullion goes out and buys either coins that they know they're going to sell, like the American Silver Eagle. Or coins that they're not sure they're going to sell, like something custom minted from the the was it Republic Mint? Republic Metals was uh, Republic former Metals. Mint. Right. Yes, yes, of course. We're not going to get into that probably today. Um, but uh, how does a bullion dealer ensure that against price drops, where you go out and you buy fifty, a hundred uh, monster boxes of Silver Eagles at let's say seventeen dollars a coin? And the price drops to 15 or you just go out and you take a flyer on a few hundred krugerrands and then the price goes down and no one wants to buy them how do you manage that inventory so that you're not stuck holding the silver bag yeah now this is a question that kind of comes down to um kind of a the the size of the of the dealer uh b how they're capitalized how, how do they have the inventory how are they able to to have that much inventory and then you know what are they willing to risk as far as fiat price movements right so here um you know tyler started this business between him and john the other co-founder uh they both put like a case of silver eagles in and just have slowly but surely built the inventory up as time has gone on so i think what the way that tyler typically looks at the inventory is is partial bank account and then partially exposure you know that he may or may not want in gold or silver prices so we will do some hedging when it gets beyond a certain uh level so at a certain point he will hedge at a certain point he will just keep it in those ounces and just keep selling it you know and, and use velocity and turnover as the way to to either you know recoup any losses he has over time right so it's um it's a combination of a few things if someone is if you have a dealer that has you know, bank capital that they're using, well, the cost of inventory definitely comes back at them. They definitely are, you know, paying higher interest rates now that the Fed has raised interest rates over the last few years. So a lot of times you'll see dealers, uh, they, they want to make sure velocity is occurring because if velocity is not happening, then they may have too much inventory and it may be costing them too much to hold all that inventory. So yeah. it's it, and it goes down to even the smallest dealer, like your local coin shop. You know, that guy typically is not going to be hedging. Typically what a local coin shop is going to do is they're going to have a tiny inventory on display. If you want to place a larger order, they'll just simply place the order with one of the largest dealers in the in the country, and then when it gets there, they'll call you and you come pick it up. That's typically how they operate. Uh, that makes sense. And because what people maybe they don't realize, because it all happens so seamlessly, you check the price of silver, you look on Kitgo or whatever site you use or Small Gold, and you see the price, and then you say, oh, it's a good price to buy, and you're just accustomed to being able to go on to SD Bullion and buy at that price or plus the the premium that you're going to pay and that's all a result of being able to do that and have properly hedged because let's say there's a 70 percent 70 cent drop in the price of silver today sd billion is still going to sell you at the price 70 cents lower correct yeah that is correct so again we go back to velocity and turnover that, that even if you're losing on a sale just make the sale right and just keep it going right you'll dollar cost average down with the inventory that you buy next because it's going to be cheaper um, so yeah you may lose in the short run on the on the unhedged supply versus the hedge supply you'll just net out right so it's it's kind of a game that you're you're always there has to be some speculation involved in right. terms of if you're doing this, you have to speculate whether or not you think prices may go up or down in the near future. But overall, you have a, a position that you just don't you won't lose because that is your inventory. That is the, the amount of ounces you own. No matter what happens with the price, you still have that. So right. and as a matter of just from customer service, you can do this 24 seven. Correct. Yeah, so, totally. So you can go on the weekend and you can buy and you get the last spot price 
that closed on Friday, and there may not be another price that's fixed until Sunday evening. Correct. When, when Shanghai Gold Exchange opens up, correct. <laughs> All right. Now I got another question about when you, you pick this inventory, I want to get a little inside baseball on what actually sells. What are some of the, the biggest sell? And are you going to put, I don't, you don't have to uh, give away the, the game before you publish your top 10, but I'm more interested in some of the ones below the top 10. And I've noticed there's been this trend towards, um, I wouldn't call them numismatics, but they're limited mintages from either the Perth Mint, the Canadian Mint, or even some private mints, and indeed you guys have made a Liberty Rounds. Uh, how well do they sell? Do you keep them as a function of just to keep customers happy? Do you get more margin on those, or you just have them there so that you can sell more of the bullion, pro the, the standard bullion products? So, um, you know, in the industry, typically new customers come along and they'll buy the standard fare, right? Like the silver eagles, the silver maples, the gold eagles, the 100 ounce bars, 10 ounce bars, one ounce, whatever. So, you know, they'll typically get that fare to start. And then once they've got a position, they, they will start looking around and seeing all these unique products and thinking that some of the designs are kind of neat and this and that. And maybe they'll buy one or two Z's here or there uh, and collect a little bit instead of just simply being a stacker buying like kind homogenous products. So it's this kind of give and take right where I personally don't you know all the position I personally own myself uh, I definitely want to keep a prudent allocation of bullion for the rest of my life but I don't necessarily think I'm going to keep everything I bought so for my mind's sake I always like to have like kind products because when it goes time to sell I want to be able to sell it quickly and easily I don't want to have to sit there and write down a hundred SKUs of what I'm going to be selling you <laughs> that's a lot more difficult than just yeah I'm selling you 500 ounces of silver eagles what is, what's your bid price you know that that's a lot easier than you know, I have 500 random rounds that I collected over the years so <clears throat> the question I, I suppose is it's kind of multivariate in the sense that we've been through a bear market now obviously Obviously in gold and silver for some time 2011 to you know the end of 2015 was really bad the price obviously fell through the floor on both precious metals so I think a lot of the mints and the dealers out there were trying to figure out a way to you know come up with some unique designs and show some creativity in that department limit the mintage and as well hopefully by doing that they can you know bl blow out a little bit of the premium and make a little bit more profit on the effort and it has been successful. I mean, there's been, you know, you, there's been a lot of, uh, it seems like agreements sometimes between those that are creating the products like the Canadian Mint, and they will only offer them to one certain dealer. And that one certain dealer has this unique 1.25 ounce coin or this 1.5 ounce coin, et cetera, et cetera. And then they'll sell it at like 50% over for, over the silver spot price. Right. And, like, and, and like that Buffalo that JM Bullion sold at one point. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was actually a pretty unique uh, product. It was kind of nice. I have some of those. I'm not trying to say that that was necessarily a bad product for people to buy. I would say... There were other ones. There were some that were like World War II initiatives and they were talking about Pearl Harbor or this or that and selling them at $30 an ounce or some silver, you know, Klondike bear coin that was selling at 30 bucks was right. spot at 18. It's like, you know, all those are essentially, if you, if you boil it down, is a way for, you know, boil, boil room shops to take people, take advantage of people and, you know, take 60% of their IRA, right? So someone buys the Klondike silver Kodak or whatever that bear coin was, they get it and okay, great, I've got my silver in my IRA and then they get their IRA and it shows this is what it's worth and it's like 60% off what they bought, right? So there, essentially the dealer is uh, is probably a boiler room shop where the person that sold it is getting half of that and then the, the people top of that business are making the other half. So it's you know, the, it, 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 it runs the gamut between as close to fraud as you can get all the way down to some very unique uh, creative products that are cool, that are interesting and that people buy and they enjoy. So it, it runs the gambit from, from, from being nefarious to being um, somewhat cool. Yeah. So I've always looked at when people say these are numismatic or semi numismatic, I said it's nonsense. A numismatic coin to me has always been something that came directly from uh, a, a functioning mint like the US mint and it wasn't produced to be rare or to be a unique design it was just happened to be a year in which very few of that particular coin was uh, issued minted 
and it's in good shape and that's a numismatic coin to me now you don't deal in that type of thing if someone wanted to come to you and say i want to round out my mercury dime collection my ben franklin half dollar collection that's not something you do is it no we're not sd numismatic we're sd bullion and <laughs> so we really try and stay in our lane when it comes to that and and really deal in the, the highest volume products that are in the best interest of purchasers when it comes to the numismatic that that is essentially like the world of high you know high-end art right mm -hmm. in order to make money in that that world you really have to be deep in that world and we are not one of those outfits there are there are a few of them that are big names but we you know we often don't play in the numismatic realm because most of the value of those coins is subjective and what we prefer is having the value of the coin or the bar etc being um, you know the actual melt of the precious metal that's in it with a slight premium so we can keep the lights on you know that that's essentially right. what we deal in typically we you know our our lane is high volume bullion transactions it's not you know this uh, rare granddaddy coin that didn't get confiscated in 1933 and now you can buy it at this right. price that doesn't that's not what we what we play in now SD bullion that I believe stands for um, silver silver doctors bullion silver so it, doctors we, bullion okay but why wh how are you guys with gold do you find that the bulk of dollars or volume comes from silver is there a nice mix or are you like your namesake primarily driven business i know you carry gold but is the business skewed towards uh silver doctors silver yeah i would say 60 percent roughly is silver 40 percent is gold you know, dollar, dollar dollar amount in, or in dollar amounts oh, correct that's a, that's a yeah. big volume of difference yeah yeah and it's it, it's interesting because in my experience firsthand you know dealing with customers is uh what you see a lot of times is the older generations the people who have less time on this earth remaining uh they typically will just go with majority gold or all gold because mm -hmm. they like the lo the lower volatility really in essence, what they're doing is they're just locking in their purchasing power, and they they feel like this is the less volatile, less risky one, and they want to want to hold that, and it takes up less space, et cetera, et cetera, and so they typically go gold. Whereas the younger crowd, you know, they're looking for alpha, they're looking for something that has potential to to do more than perhaps gold. That they have more time on their hands to wait it out. So a lot of times they'll be more aggressive and go maybe all silver or majority silver in their stacking. Yeah, we do see that, and that silver does. I call it the spike and dive metal. And I guess if, as you say, you have a lot of time left on this earth, you do see over history these when you have a bull run in gold that the silver will have a mega bull run. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess you know if you're looking for that speculative pop that you can get out of pre precious metals, you're gonna get it probably more in silver than you are in gold but like you say the gold is going to be uh, a bit more stable and clearly if you look at long-term charts that is the case that gold has definitely held its value on a much more stable level although if you average it out and you include the spikes they're almost identical over mm -hmm. you know a 25 25 year period it's just that if you weren't get holding during that spike period you didn't get the gain there Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on now to the markets. Well, thank you very much for that portion of the interview, James, about uh, getting into precious metals. I think it's uh, it's very interesting because the industry is not, if you had to guess, how many people do you think are actually engaged in the buying and selling of uh, bullion? I don't think yeah. it's... It's not that many. I mean, if you look at the high volume online dealers, we're a top five dealer in the United States. And... You know, when you when you crunch down on on the online side, there's probably hundreds, maybe a thousand dealers. Uh, probably some of them are doing it part time because there's not much revenue, or right. you know, you have to, in order to find the dealership, they're like 10, 10 back on a Google page. Uh, whereas you know, on local coin shop level, um, a lot of it's gotten you know beaten down by the internet in the sense that people could buy from their local coin shop or they could buy online and. and probably save a little bit more online because of economies of scale uh, and so they typically will just buy online so a lot of the local coin shops have died off and if you go to local coin shops for the most part they're mostly owned by older generation people who lived through the 1970 1980 bull yes. market right and so there there's not that many around it these days and at least not that many that are really competent you know, what you find most of the time when you when you google you know coin shop in your mega city that you may be in uh, you're gonna find 
I don't know, maybe a third of them are legit. And then about two thirds of them are like, we buy gold shops or some, some other thing where it's like a pawn shop that has gold in its name, but it's, it's not a place that you actually make a market. It's, it's really a joke. Uh, so when you actually crunch down, we were talking about maybe 20,000 people who work in this industry. It's not that many people. No. Well, now let's move on to the markets in the final time that we have here. Now, I'm not asking you to make predictions, but we are seeing now since December, and that somewhat coincided with the decline in the stock market, some healthy moves in the gold and silver prices. Do you think this is sustainable? And also want to get your view on what happened with palladium mm -hmm. and whether there is any type of correlation to what might happen with silver. I saw an article today in Bloomberg. I, I said to myself, oh my God, they've gone silver pumper. It actually said, so it didn't say silver silver to, shortage I saw silver it. shortage but it didn't say silver set to skyrocket and they did put a price on it they said because of the shortage it, it, the price of uh silver may go to like 1750 i guess mm -hmm. for them that's that's skyrocketing do you do you see some type of uh i mean this was an analysis it seemed like it was a throwaway piece they had to get out there i, I thought it was like clickbait but uh how do you view the uh the current supply demand dynamic of gold silver and then apply it somehow to palladium if it's even relevant right so first and foremost you need to kind of understand where the price discovery comes from and that is <laughs> to me one of the most ass backwards places of all time if you go down the rabbit hole of what is the comex or what is the nymex and you start understanding that you know high high 90 percentile of it is based on derivatives so it's just people trading amongst each other um pseudo contracts that are supposedly backed by gold or silver but it's not necessarily the case so when you understand a how the price discovery is made that that, that kind of throws a question into the price that we use every day. It really kind of makes it dubious in the sense that, well, yeah, the price may be going up in gold and silver of late, and it's probably because the derivative betters going long are outweighing the derivative betters going short. Uh, whereas in the real world, uh, how much supply there is, I'm always worried, I'm always concerned about that, I'm always studying that. And that's the dynamic when you actually have people come in to buy the physical uh, products. That is the dynamic, if they come in mass, that's the dynamic that really makes the market move because all of a sudden it becomes more difficult for these derivative uh, price discovery exchanges to actually have the physical to back up the claims you know, in their warehouses. So this is, uh, you know, you, you brought up palladium, I'd say that right now that's probably the, the one place in the physical bullion market that has the most acute issue going on right now that's in backward backwardation and for listeners out there, all backwardation simply means is that the spot price, the price that you have for palladium, the price that you can get it over the counter is much higher than the futures price uh, at the moment. And it just basically, whenever we're in backwardation, that essentially is saying that we're having an acute shortage of metal. And in palladium, I think we discussed a week or two ago about the TOCOM and how ridiculous that <laughs> Japanese futures exchange is. They only have nine kilos of palladium in their warehouse. I mean, that... That in, there's other people out there. This gentleman I've interviewed a few times, his name's Dave Jensen. He's really uh, always on top of the palladium market at the moment. He's always tweeting about it. And he looks a lot at lease rates, and lease rates will tell you a lot about you know how the supply and demand is doing for physical product and palladium lease rates have been in the high 20s in the last few months i think they're in the teens at the moment but i think what we're seeing right now is that um, the derivative complex is totally outweighed the actual physical market and when that happens for a long time you can get acute um, you know basically issues where all of a sudden no we don't have enough supply we didn't realize that the palladium uh, would be in such high demand in the last five, six years after the Volkswagen scandal, uh, the scandal that they had with the diesel engines. Diesel, and right, how, right. Yeah, and how much palladium now is used in automotive versus uh, platinum. So I think what we're seeing is when there are shortages, you will end up seeing backwardation and you'll see situations where the physical price gets much more expensive than the, the derivative price. And the derivative price, the futures prices that the COMEX and NYMEX print, may not necessarily be the price of say the physical product in the real in the real world so when i was thinking about silver because i generally take the view that if there is some type of financial calamity people concerned about too much debt or collapse or whatever it is that gold is the go-to metal for most wealthy people most older people but silver 
also comes along for that ride, but it seems to come along a little later. But in this concept of having a, a shortage, if there was some type of gold shortage and there wasn't a collapse, people can hold off on having gold because it's only 10% industry, meaning that you don't have to have an extra bracelet. You don't have to have the jewelry for gold if there is a, um, a shortage. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go out and buy bars because there's a shortage. But in industry, and you can hold off if the price is rising, but in industry, like in palladium or silver, if there is this type of shortage or an acute shortage, manufacturers are still going to buy and they're going to have to buy. And isn't that the case where then they have to pay the price so in a mm -hmm. in a commodity you might have a better chance of some type of squeeze if it's in the the physical market because a manufacturer who makes solar panels or who makes electronics they're not going to balk at paying they're just going to pay and if they have to pass it along they'll pass it along do you recall back in 2008-9 you were mentioning that the physical market for Silver Eagles at the time of the price was, this is financial crisis driven. Around mm -hmm. 2009, you said the price, 2008, was $9 an ounce and you can sell um, Silver Eagle. You could buy, you had to pay $15, $16 for Silver Eagles. I don't think that even at the height of the 2011 price of, of $50 an ounce for silver that we saw any manufacturer say, that's it. We're done. We're not making. Did did we see any of that at all? Where a manufacturer balked at a higher price? No, no. And, and remember too that manufacturers the silver amount that's in like an electronic or a solar panel, etc. It's not it's not that huge, right? Right. And you could you can kind of pass it along to your end user customer. Uh, so really, what you're describing is a situation that others have described before, where yeah, the price of silver could go beyond fifty dollars an ounce, and industry will still have to buy it. And they'll pass along the, the increased small costs of the silver and the electronics to the end user. So all you get is just price inflation in the, in the actual manufactured product. But it's such small amounts, it'll be very, very small. You won't even notice it, really. It's not that big uh, amounts of silver. I think like a cell phone has less than, has like a fraction of a gram of silver in it. A computer, same story. Um, so it's it's not... It's not extremely prohibitive. The issue is, is that you have to have it. Right. And so manufacturers may end up feeding on this issue. And if they get scared, if they get worried, they may end up having to buy a head, assuming that, you know, if we don't, it's going to be more expensive. So we may as well lock it in now and get our physical silver in our industry, in our warehouse, so we can produce our product and not have any hangups. Because, you know, if you're manufacturing, you, you can't have two months off because you can't find any silver, you can't <laughs> source any silver. The, that That's unacceptable. So right. it, it's kind of the same situation that we're seeing with palladium. We saw that in palladium in 2001, I believe, when it went to a price that was four times the price of gold. It had it had this weird, crazy bull market because Russia stopped um, delivering palladium to the open market. And so all of a sudden, the the inventory orders at Ford dealership, they, 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 were, they got spooked and they started buying palladium hand over fist. And the palladium price eventually uh, collapsed once Russia came back online and started delivering more of the palladium they mine. Uh, and the, I think Ford had to write off about a billion dollar loss because they didn't hedge as we, you know, we, did, we right. talked about earlier. <laughs> Yeah, the, the inventory department didn't hedge the price. Yeah, they were, so they were it, hedging the other part of the business, which was making sure they had the palladium, but they correct. didn't hedge the price of the palladium. Mm -hmm. Correct. So they had to write off a billion dollar loss on that. And that's, uh, you know, it's what we'd end up seeing if there was really a spook uh, in the market about, you know, silver not having enough for the inventory. You could definitely see that feeding upon itself and becoming irrational. Right, and then what would happen actually, but the part that wouldn't be irrational is you would see tightness if some organizations went out and decided they needed to have certainty of supply, they can either work with a miner and say, I want uh, certain requirements out of you, or they can go out and acquire it, which would lead to further tightness. Now, I know the one thing is you can't put a COMEX contract into a solar panel. You could say, well, <laughs> I, I have all this value here, but that's when the rubber hits the road where silver has some type of industrial upside a lot of people they like to say that silver has uh limited upside because it's an industrial commodity well that's true it limits its monetary value it certainly does but it also the reason i mentioned palladium is you can have a bull market in a commodity as we've seen in palladium as well mm -hmm. 
All right, James. Well, I really want to thank you for joining me today. And uh, where can people reach you to get your insights, your free eBooks, and just follow sure. you in general? Yeah. Um, so if people want to buy or sell from us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sdbullying.com is the website. When I got here, one of the first things I did was I wrote a free ebook for people if they want to, you know, get more of an in-depth understanding of the of the precious metals industry on our side. Uh, you can go to the URL sdbullion.com forward slash book and you can pick up a free PDF guide there I, I wrote myself. Um, you know, apologies, I didn't have an editor, so <laughs> there may be a couple <laughs> misspellings here or there. Or, you know, it's kind of a it's a pretty large book, but. The good thing is there's a lot of pictures and charts in it too. So it's a free PDF. You just get it in your email box and you can check it out. It's got, I think, a good bit of information uh, for people who want to learn how to buy gold and silver and do it, you know, due diligence properly and make sure that they never get involved with a dealer that's perhaps failing or uh, make mistakes when it comes time to sell, et cetera. Now, can you just give us some quick uh, red flags you mentioned in the pre pre call, sure. which are some red flags for dealing with bullion dealers? Totally. So there's various uh, websites out there that help with um, trying to get reviews that are not fake. Now, there's websites where the reviews get rigged and you have to be careful of those. But one of the websites I, I think is really good. They do a good job and it's trustworthy. The reviews, they're all legit. They use <clears throat> order numbers to make sure that the reviews they're getting are legit and they coincide with the order number sequence. So golddealerreviews.com is a pretty good one. Uh, they have... I don't know, maybe 20 of our competitors on there, but essentially any any dealer on there with over four four stars is typically pretty trustworthy. And what I would suggest is people every time before you buy, and you know, unless you're buying you know small amount that you could afford to lose, uh, you should go on that review site and see the latest reviews and make sure that there's no hangups and people are getting their product in the allotted time that they've been promised. If there are long delays, for instance, I used that website back when. Right, right before Tolving went under. And uh, for those that don't understand what Tolving was, it was essentially um, a high volume bullion dealer that was not an AP, but was acting as if they were and selling a product at uh, very, very slim margins. And my hunch is they got uh, on the wrong side of a trade and they were unhedged. And then they started using their customers' uh, finances to uh, perhaps stay solvent for longer than they would have. And that started to produce delays. And on that website, you could see the, the trail of tears. It was a long trail of tears. It took about a year for it to finally go under. But if you've been looking at that website before you ordered, you would not got caught up in that lawsuit that, that just ended. Uh, it took years to go through. And the people who do, did lose their money got pennies back on the dollar. So that's my suggestion is that anytime you go to buy, especially with an amount that you can't afford to lose, you better make sure that the reviews you're reading are real and that they are doing what they promise to their customers. All right. Well, thank you very much, James, for joining me today on the Small Gold Subscriber Sound Off series. Thanks, Lewis. I really appreciate it. And all you listeners out there, uh, keep stacking mugs.